In this video, I'm doing a deep dive into finasteride, minoxidil, and microneedling. I'll show you how to rejuvenate and fix your hairline using these three things. I'll even show you potential side effects, how likely you are to get them, how to prevent them, and how to fix it should you get these side effects. Additionally, I'll give you some tips and tricks on how to maximize your results, and I'll touch on some more advanced concepts such as hair transplants, tretinoin, PRP, and many other things. It's going to be a very informative video, so let's get started. Okay, so first I want to touch about what is male pattern baldness. So male pattern baldness is, is the most typical cause of hair loss in a man. It's all essentially dictated by genetics. Some say that it comes from the mother's side of the family, but in reality it can happen to anyone. It is actually very well understood scientifically. What causes male pattern baldness? It's essentially due to the sensitivity of hair follicles to androgens, specifically the powerful androgen known as DHT. DHT is a hormone that is converted from testosterone via a process known as 5-alpha reduction. Essentially, the body transforms a certain amount of testosterone to DHT. Some men have follicles that are not sensitive to DHT and thus they never develop male pattern baldness. Or they simply do not produce enough DHT or perhaps even testosterone to miniaturize and destroy hair follicles. Over time, the DHT attacks the hair follicles causing men to lose hair. This can also affect women. This is known as androgenic alopecia, and it's what we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, so let's dive right into the first thing that you're gonna need, and that's called finasteride. So a little bit of a lesson here. So the way that DHT, so the way that the fact that DHT is what controls male pattern baldness was discovered by observing and studying a unique group of people from the Dominican Republic. Now this group of men specifically, they were essentially born with a genetic deficiency in which their bodies were unable to convert testosterone to DHT. This condition is known as 5-alpha reductase deficiency. And it's actually a form of pseudohermaphroditism. It's kind of a hard word to say. The main problem with these men is that due to the lack of DHT, they never fully developed a penis in the womb. And when they were born, they had ambiguous genitalia and were often raised as girls because of this even though they had XY chromosomes. During puberty, they did develop male genitalia, but it, was, it is unclear if it was uh, average or full size. But it is known that DHT is very important during childhood and puberty in the development of the penis. In adulthood, these men had pristine hairlines. Interestingly, they also seem to be more mus muscular than their male siblings who did not have that deficiency. Additionally, they had no acne and no facial hair. And that is because beard, beard hair, needs DHT to develop. They also never developed enlarged prostates. So when scientists at Merck created a compound which mimicked this deficiency. They first developed Pro Proscar, which was prescribed at five milligrams a day to men with enlarged prostates. Later, they developed finasteride, which was prescribed at one milligram per day to men with male pattern baldness, also known as androgenic alopecia. So finasteride is just a first line therapy when it comes to combating male pattern baldness. It essentially stops hair loss and may potentially cause regrowth of the hair if the hair follicles have not fully died yet. However, the longer that you wait, the less effective that the finasteride treatment will be. If started early enough, finasteride will be enough to retain a good hairline for most men. However, it's important to note that you don't want to start this too early, particularly if you're still in puberty, because then your dick will just not fully develop. Something I'll touch more on the side effects part. So the first step in fixing your hairline is taking one milligram of finasteride every day. You can even start one milligram finasteride every other day, as it's been shown to be as effective in smaller doses. That's what I do these days. Next, I wanna to touch on minoxidil, the next thing that you'll need to fix your hairline. So minoxidil was developed by Pfizer way back in the 1950s. It was initially, it was initially meant to treat hypertension and ulcers, but one of the observed side effects was hypotrichosis or excessive hair growth. In 1988, Rogaine was developed as an FDA-approved prescription topical solution for hair loss. In 1996, the FDA approved Rogaine to be sold over the counter. Now, the mechanism of action of minoxidil or Rogaine is not fully understood. It's mostly understood to be a potassium channel opener. It basically opens up the blood vessels and allows more potassium to flow through them. So it allows for more blood flow, potassium, and oxygen, and other nutrients to flow to the hair follicles. There's actually an enzyme in the skin that converts topical minoxidil to its active form called minoxidil sulfate. Some people have varying amounts of that enzyme that converts minoxidil to its active form. So something is important to know from the studies is that minoxidil is a collagen inhibitor, which is something I'll discuss more later. Also more interesting 
is that minoxidil has been shown to be an anti-androgen. Again, something that I'll touch on a little bit later. Interestingly, minoxidil also has antifibrotic properties. And with androgenic alopecia, after enough time, fibrosis starts to form at the side of the hair follicles. Because it's an antifibrotic, this may explain a little bit as to how minoxidil actually works. Now, in the packaging and all the official minoxidil studies, it's only recommended to be used in the crown area. It has been shown to be effective to stimulate hair regrowth in the crown area. However, however, it can absolutely be used in other areas, primarily in the temples, the hairline, and also in the beard area. In this video, however, I mostly focus in the temple and hairline area. You can optionally first grow a beard and then fix your hairline. Personally, I'm doing the reverse. I'm trying to I'm regrowing my hairline and then gonna be regrowing my beard. And this is because I don't want or recommend using too much minoxidil at once because it has a higher chance of going systemic and causing side effects. So there's two types of minoxidil, at least topical minoxidil. There's the liquid version, basically use a little dropper to apply it. And then there's the foam version. I personally prefer the foam version because it dries up a little bit faster, like way faster. And I find it just easier to apply, but it's mostly a matter of personal preference. You can apply minoxidil one or two times a day. I started off with twice a day but because of my schedule and because I saw results, I currently only apply it once a day. Now keep in mind that minoxidil can be toxic to animals, specifically cats and potentially other humans. So either wash it off after a few hours after you applied it or make sure, make sure you change your sheets and pillowcases if you have children coming over and touching the bed. So minoxidil is really used for hair regrowth, right? For Nasteride, is to stop and halt the hair loss. Minoxidil is to recover hair. So you don't need to use it if you're just preventing hair loss. You can just use finasteride for that. But you can use it to try to regain dead zones that finasteride alone is not gonna reactivate. Okay, so the next part of the regimen is called microneedling. So microneedling essentially is a popular technique in which a device with small needles is used on the skin. Microneedling actually has a, quite a few use cases. The main ones are for treating scars, stretch marks, and wrinkles. Microneedling essentially is a collagen inductor. So when you're doing it at a relatively shallow depth, it forces the skin to produce collagen at the side of the damage. And that's why it's useful for skin rejuvenation. In a nutshell, when you induce damage on the skin through microneedling, you initiate the healing process. This process releases growth factors, breaks down scars, and allows the skin to revascularize. I have different videos on microneedling for wrinkles and scars. Here I'll focus on hair regrowth. But microneedling basically enhances the delivery of substances to the layers beneath the skin. Because it creates breakages in the skin, it allows substances to reach the dermis, which is below the skin, below the skin barrier, and the dermis has blood flow. And so this mechanism of action, like this way that it breaks the skin barrier, the skin barrier is key to its effectiveness in hair regrowth because first it breaks down the fibrotic hair follicles so if the hair follicles are already fibro fibrotic it breaks them down and allows them to be revascularized meaning it allows them to start receiving nutrient filled blood it basically revitalizes the hair follicles now microneedling for hair regrowth is the most effective when paired with topical minoxidil and again this is because it's breaks the skin, the skin barrier and allows minoxidil to be better absorbed into the underlying hair follicles. Okay, next I'm gonna outline a protocol. This is a protocol that I've been using with really good results and it's getting there. I think it's only getting better. I'm also gonna be showing you my results. You can see the before and after. You can clearly see the after in this video and you can tell from the before that it was it was pretty bad. I attribute, it, I attribute most of the regains, most of the growth to finasteride, but to really go that last mile, I had to implement minoxidil and microneedling. So I'll go into that right now. So finasteride, minoxidil, and microneedling are essential, and it's essentially all you need to fix your hairline in most cases. I'll go over some more advanced things that you can do later in the video. However, first I wanna start with these three main things because they're essentially the meat and potatoes of fixing a hairline. So first, start by getting a prescription of finasteride, which is prescribed at one milligram per day. This is gonna halt hair loss. Do this for about a year, year and a half. And you're gonna just want to evaluate the results. And if you're happy, just continue to take finasteride. Again, you can start with one milligram every other day, reevaluate about maybe three, six months, and go up from there if necessary. If you're not happy with the results, or you spot dead zones, 
that finasteride is not helping regrow, you can start adding minoxidil. So essentially apply minoxidil one to two times a day to the templates and the entire hairline and optionally to the crown. Keep in mind the more minoxidil you use, the more likely you're going to get effects, side effects from the minoxidil. I'll go into side effects a little bit later. Now to make minoxidil even more effective, you have to incorporate microneedling. So I recommend getting the Derminator 2, which I reviewed in a separate video. You can find that over here. I use and recommend the 1.0 millimeter depth with a 12 needle cartridge with the Derminator 2. And microneedle the temples and the hairline until you cause a little bit of redness. You want like pinpoint bleeding. Do this every week, the same day of the week. Once you're done microneedling, apply some castor oil and then you can go to sleep. Let the castor oil absorb. The next day, wash the castor oil off and you can apply minoxidil and that's it. So you basically take a pill and apply a little bit of foam every day and you do microneedling once a week. This is gonna what's gonna help you restore your hairline. And if you're losing hair at the crown, also apply minoxidil at the crown and microneedle that area as well. So I also wanna go through the um, side effects. So first I'm gonna go through the side effect profile Profile so finasteride. I'll talk on topical minoxidil and microneedling. This is especially important uh, with finasteride, as it can potentially cause long-term side effects, which will not go away even if you stop the medication. So first, let me preface by saying this: like, don't let the potential side effects scare you. They happen to one, maybe two percent of users, and can potentially just be a nocebo effect. First, finasteride blocks the production of DHT, and DHT is incredibly important in male fetuses and during puberty for a male. DHT is essential for the formation of the male sexual organ, the penis. So if a fetus is exposed to finasteride, they will not fully develop a penis. So it's extremely important not to let a pregnant woman even handle a tablet as the active ingredient can potentially penetrate the skin and affect the fetus. If you're trying to have children, I do not recommend that you take finasteride. If you are taking finasteride and want to have a child, take at least a month off, maybe two months off, before attempting to conceive. And after conception, wear a condom if you're having sex. Potentially don't even have sex during the pregnancy. And this is because finasteride has been found in small amounts in seminal fluid. So it's been found in the semen. So be very careful around pregnant women and children, especially boys, with this stuff. Secondly, finasteride can disrupt horm hormonal levels, especially if you're close to being hypogonadal, meaning you're low on testosterone or DHT. This can cause a cascade of events. So even, even if you have high testosterone, this can also be an issue because finasteride actually raises the testosterone level slightly and too much testosterone will be converted to estrogen and this can cause things like gynecomastia. So what I recommend in order to help combat this is uh, to take a hormonal snapshot before you start taking finasteride. So Derek for More Place More Dates actually has a service called uh, Merrick Health and they offer a comprehensive pre-finasteride panel so that you can take a snapshot of everything relevant before starting the medication. It's a little pricey. You can go and like just do the basics, DHT, testosterone, estrogen, estro estradiol, and so on. But they have a very good comprehensive panel. But by having a snapshot of your vital levels, should anything go wrong and you experience side effects, you have your base levels that you can work toward restoring. Thirdly, it has been shown that finasteride lowers penile weight in rats. Now granted, this was with high concentrations of finasteride, but keep in mind, even though they give high concentrations of rats over weeks, as humans, we end up consuming the same over years and decades. But anyways, interestingly, there was no change in the tissue content of the penile rats, even though they weighed less. So it is most likely that it was caused because of lowered blood flow to the penis. And it is well known that finasteride can lower libido, and compromise nighttime and spontaneous erections. And over time, this can lead to atrophy and weakening of the penile tissues, potentially shortening if you're not getting erections every day. So the best way to combat this is to take daily Cialis, not Viagra, Cialis. So this is because Cialis stays in your system longer. You can take five milligrams of Cialis every day, right before you go to bed. You can also supplement with L-citrulline 3,000 milligrams per day in the mornings. Also, this is something that I highly recommend and also because I promote, you know, I do PE and I think it's, it's very, very effective and, and useful is you should be using a vacuum erection device daily to ensure that the tissues of the penis remain healthy and that no atrophy happens. 
Watch my other video on the new BPE routine and how to use a penis pump. Especially if you combine Cialis with pumping, this can really, really help. So basically, this allows you to manage and counteract potential side effects of finasteride. You can also, again, you can start with lowering the dosage. So taking a pill every other day. Now, I do not recommend breaking up pills because this will expose the, uh, the active ingredients. Like usually it's in a capsule, so it's the active ingredients is, is inside it. So it's very hard for it to be absorbed. But if you break it up, now you're potentially exposing women and children to its active ingredients. So I do not recommend breaking up tablets. Now, minoxidil. Minoxidil is relatively safe. However, if enough of it goes systemic, it can cause things like chest pain, dizziness, and high blood pressure. It can also increase water retention in the area, in the face. This may also show as bags under the eye. If you take Cialis, the, the blood pressure side effect can be concerning because Ocialis also will incre increase blood pressure. So firstly, only apply the minimally necessary amount of minoxidil and focus on the areas that you really care about. You should also get a blood weight monitor and keep track of your blood pressure to make sure it's at a healthy level. To deal with water retention, you should ideally be in a low carb diet and drink a lot of water and electrolytes. Also make sure you exercise often, lift weights. This will help your body shed the extra water and help you stay hydrated. Additionally, minoxidil is a collagen inhibitor and can cause dry skin if used in the face. If you're using it for the temples, it can cause wrinkles in the forehead. The best way to counteract this is by having a good skincare routine. Use a moisturizer, use hyaluronic acid, and sunblock every day. I personally apply liberal amounts of Nivea Soft, especially to the forehead. So I have a pretty good skincare routine, which is a combination of geology products, hyaluronic acid serum, sunblock, and Nivea Soft. This is what Nivea Soft looks like. I'll leave links to all of this stuff below. Also, you can use microneedling in the affected areas, particularly the forehead. And again, because microneedling is a collagen inductor, so I personally do this to enhance collagen production in the face, especially in the forehead. Now, microneedling is generally very safe and well tolerated, but there's a couple of things I want to touch on. First is going too deep. Not usually something bad, but in this case, it can be. So I have personally not gone for more than one millimeter in the hairline and 0.5 millimeters in the face. Going too deep can actually cause more damage than is needed to stimulate growth and collagen formation. Refer to the manual of the Terminator 2 for the actual specific depth for whatever you're trying to treat. But personally, I use one millimeter for the hairline and 0.5 millimeter for the face. So you only need pinpoint bleeding. You don't need some crazy amounts of bleeding. This can, this can cause problems like a scarring and pigmentation, which is the last thing that you want. Secondly, is doing it too often. For the hairline, I recommend just doing it once a week at most. And I have seen really good results just doing it once a week. For skin rejuvenation, you can actually do it less. I started off once a week until I realized I was, I realized I was doing it too often. Now I'm doing it every two to three weeks and I potentially may cut it down to once a month. Also, we have to be careful about what you apply after microneedling. So applying something like a retinol can cause burning in the skin. Stick to something that's natural and safe. For the face, I use hyaluronic acid. I use this hyaluronic acid serum and castor oil for the hair. And that's some uh, tips and tricks as to potential side effects and how you can manage, avoid them and potentially treat them. So let's move on. Okay, so now I'm gonna start going through some more advanced concepts. So I'm gonna start with tretinoin. So pe some people are basically not responders to minoxidil and stop and it's thought because they basically lack the enzyme that is needed to convert topical minoxidil to its active ingredient. And tretinoin is basically a prescription topical cream derived from vitamin A, and it's mainly used for skin re it's mainly used for skin rejuvenation and diminishing of fine wrinkles. There's a lot of studies that prove its efficacy in skin rejuvenation. So in scientific studies, it's been proven that using tretinoin and minoxidil improves the efficacy of minoxidil. So first, it allows you to only have to apply minoxidil one time per day and have the same results as applying it two times per day, just applying minoxidil alone. So if you combine minoxidil and tretinoin, you can only just apply it once a day. Secondly, it enhances the absorption of minoxidil through the skin. Now I'm personally exploring using tretinoin for skin rejuvenation and potentially replacing microneedling with it just to improve the efficacy of my, uh, minoxidil. But it's not something I could personally recommend at this point, just because I haven't tried it myself. But it looks very promising. And it's uh, something that it looks very safe and um, something that looks good to do. Now, if you're microneedling, I don't think you really need to add tretinoin 
at least you, you're not in such a big rush to add it. Now, I want to talk about oral minoxidil. So some people, certain people do not respond to topical minoxidil, even when combined with tranoin or microneedling, or they just want something that's more effective, or they just want, don't want to deal with the application. They want to do something that's easier to, to deal with. And because the mechanism of action of minoxidil is different from finasteride, you can actually stack them together in pill form. So because of this, some people opt to use oral minoxidil. So oral minoxidil is basically just its pill form, and you, you basically take a pill for it every day. And that delivers the minoxidil to your system. There's actually evidence that it's actually more effective than topical minoxidil, and it can actually cause hair growth in all parts of the body. However, it increases the emergence of side effects, especially high blood pressure and heart palpitations. It's not something that I would personally recommend, especially if you're taking Cialis. It's just the, the chances of side effects is just too high for me to personally use or recommend. Next, I want to touch on topical finasteride. So topical finasteride is just a different formulation of finasteride that you can get. It's, a, it's essentially just like the oral finasteride, but it's delivered, compounded through a chemical mix that penetrates the skin barrier to deliver finasteride directly to the hair follicles. And it has been shown that topical finasteride is equally as effective. Actually, it's a slightly less effective, but not by much. Um, but it actually has way less side effects than oral finasteride. However, because it's a topical skin penetrating agent, it's not something that I would personally recommend or use. I have kids and I definitely don't want to expose them to that. Even though I take all kinds of precautions, even with minoxidil, with my bed sheets and my pillowcases and taking a shower when I see them. It can be very dangerous. Topical finasteride can be very dangerous to women and children if they're exposed to it. So it's just something that I would not personally recommend. But if you're not around women or children, I think it's something that you should absolutely look into. So I want to only briefly touch on the tasteride. So the tasteride is just a stronger form of finasteride. So the tasteride can actually inhibit 90% of DHT and more forms of DHT and more forms of the 5 alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride. So finasteride only blocks around 70% of DHT and only blocks about one of the enzymes and only blocks one of the enzymes that is in charge of the 5-alpha reductase process. So dutasteride is just way stronger. Dutasteride is actually more effective than finasteride, but it has a much higher probability of side effects. I would not use dutasteride unless you're okay with the side effects or not responding to finasteride after a year or more of taking it. So I would only use it in extreme cases. And even then, honestly, I would probably prefer to get a hair transplant and then take in finasteride over just taking to test right which brings me to the next thing which are hair transplants so this protocol the protocol that i outlined which is finasteride minoxidil and microneedling will only work if you're not too far gone so let's say if we look at the the norwood scale if you're about a norwood three or below it should work very very well <clears throat> maybe a norwood four <clears throat> you can get decent results but anything beyond that i think you should seriously consider getting a hair transplant but keep in mind that you still need to take finasteride. So this is something like what happened to Joe Rogan and many many other people where they only got the hair transplant, but then they didn't take the medication. So the hair transplant basically failed because they continue to lose hair. And at some point they just ran out of the donor area. So if you don't take the finasteride and the medication, uh, you will continue to lose hair even with the, with the transplant. You can even combine it with minoxidil to help the transplanted hair grow better. Also, if you're considering getting a hair transplant, make sure you get the FUE procedure because it leaves less scarring, it leaves like little point pinpoint scarring. But with FUT, essentially that leaves you with a huge scar in the back of the head, just like Joe Rogan. So it would look nasty if you decide to shave it off. I mean, you know, maybe you don't care, but like I would care. Uh, I won't dive too much into hair transplants in this video, but I just wanted to touch on them. Okay, I want to touch on uh, a few more additional techniques. So I'm only going to lightly touch on them. So I have stuck with uh, I have stuck with clinically studied and proven scientific methods. What I already outlined does work, and so everything else I pretty much deem it unnecessary. I deem it unnecessary to even look at other things that don't have as much scientific evidence as finasteride, minoxidil, and microneedling. So first, let's start with scalp micropigmentation. So this is when you essentially get your head tattooed. So the head tattoo, and it gives the illusion that hair is growing out of those areas. In my opinion, it looks fucking ridiculous. It might work well 
if you combine it with the other techniques that I, out I outline, maybe even with a hair transplant, when the tattoo is fresh, it looks decent. But over time, it starts turning blue, and I think it just looks fucking dumb. I would not do this or recommend it. Next is uh, Keto Console's shampoo. So it's a basically an antifungal and it's said, uh, shampoo, and it's said to help prevent hair loss. It's essentially a topical anti-androgen. So basically, it blocks DHT at the scalp. I do not recommend the shampoo as you can just take finasteride to block DHT. And additionally, as I mentioned before, topical DHT blockers are dangerous to women and children. So it's just not something that I would recommend. Next is low level laser therapy. So it's basically this device that you wear on your head that shines lasers on your scalp. And the lasers are said to improve blood flow and uh, stimulates hair follicles. Uh, it stimulates the hair follicles to grow. Um, there's a little bit of scientific evidence for it. But for me, it's just way too time consuming and it looks like a fucking hassle. I'd rather just microneedle once a week to achieve the increased blood flow to the hair follicles in the scalp. Then there's hair fibers. So these are little flakes that you can sprinkle on your hair to give the appearance of uh, thicker hair. Um, I think this is fine to supplement your hair, but it can become runny if it rains or it gets wet. Also, if someone like a girl or your partner uh, runs their hands through your hair, they'll get it smeared on their hands. And because of this, it's not something that I would personally use or recommend. I think it's kind of ridiculous, especially if you get caught, right? Next, I'll go through one of the more interesting ones. Uh, it's called RU58841. It's essentially a topical anti-androgen, and it's relatively new and experimental. It's somewhat promising uh, because it basically it binds to the androgen receptors and prevents DHT from attacking the hair follicles. So finasteride blocks the production of DHT, whereas RU58841 blocks DHT to binding to those hair follicle androgen receptors. Um, so RU58841 does not affect hormone levels and does not seem to have the same uh, side effects that finasteride ha has because of the hormones and the you know, erection quality and so on. However, it's still new. It has not been uh, clinically tested as much as finasteride has for safety or efficacy. And just because it's a topical, it doesn't mean it cannot go systemic. So my main concern would be like, while well, finasteride lowers DHT, uh, RU58841 completely blocks DHT in the receptors that it has attached to. So for me, the danger is that it goes systemic and say attaches to the penile um, DHT receptors, potentially causing issues. So personally, I would stick with finasteride than um, you know trying RU58841. There's some other things that are more advanced, but I, you know, I want to keep this video short. So additionally, I always stay away from topical antiandrogens again, because of the, the danger to women and children. And I also want to touch on exosomes and, and PRP, platelet rich plasma. These are two very different, but also very similar techniques. They're basically injections that stimulate um, growth factors and collagen formation. And this can help revitalize the hair follicles. In, in my opinion, they're semi-effective, kind of effective. Um, it's something I can definitely get in conjunction with, say, like a hair transplant, or if you're already doing finasteride, minoxidil, microneedling. Uh, I think it's good to get; would be good to get. But for the cost, I just don't really see a point. I think you'll get way more bang for the buck, uh, which is the basics, which I already outlined in this video. And there you go. I went a little, a little bit deep. That's what she said. Um, but you know, I really wanted to be kind of exhaustive and really touch on a lot, a lot of the key things. Uh, but again, the meat and potatoes is finasteride, minoxidil, and microneedling. Uh, as you can tell, I've got pretty good results. I'm still dealing with a little bit of like the, the collagen issues from the minoxidil, which I'm dealing with microneedling and probably adding trinoin. Um, you know, I get a lot of good, um, a lot of good. Um, comments right like i'm almost i'm cl getting close to being 40 and i haven't gotten a hair transplant or anything like that and my hairline is pretty good um you know i slicked it back to this video for this video just so that you could see uh this is like the worst part the the part that i'm still working on and it's getting there it's really getting there and i've only been doing this for uh close to four months so i expect that within a year or so it, it'll get even better uh when i let my hair grow which is what i'm doing you know, the, the hair actually kind of hides a lot of this stuff. And, you know, it makes me look um, what I think is my best. It gives me a lot of confidence to uh, pick up girls and talk to them. So if you like this video, please make sure you check out these other videos here. Um, and make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. Help support this channel. And, uh, yeah, make sure you leave a comment, like, hit that subscribe button right now. And hopefully this was an interesting video, somewhat informative video. And stay tuned for more content. Peace.